Um, but I've been doing hey, that. What's going on? Hey, Michael, how are you? Doing I've good. been doing that for about five years. I'm doing all right. Randy's Randy's gonna he's got a new computer, so he's he's gonna mess with some stuff in the background. Okay, cool. Um, I was just telling him, see how you got my my dollar bill in the background here. <laughs> Are you going to I was just saying, I, I was just figuring out how to play with these different filters. So if we want to, if if we want to throw YouTube for a loop, we can we can have our meeting like this, <laughs> like the congregation of the lizard people. <laughs> and then uh, people get on and they're like, "Yeah, these people are getting into some serious stuff." Just have the lizard people in the background so people don't take it too seriously. Yeah, we'll have Obama join us. What's going on? Hey, Tyson. I think you're all right. It's quiet now. Can I get a screen share, Michael? Uh, it should be open, but I guess not. It should be good. Okay, yep, here we go. Let's see now. Do you guys have uh okay, so I'm on the PowerPoint now. Do you guys all see that? Yep. And then the Bible you all see? Yep. Yep. Okay, and then I'll keep one on Google in case I end up Googling something. Um was it, um, Michael, was it Raya? Was that her name that was going to join us? Yeah. Is she coming? I don't know. Okay. I thought she I thought she was on that message earlier today that said she was coming. I might have missed it, though. Yeah, oh, she, but she's located in, like, the UK. So, uh -huh. like, yeah, her timing is a little different. So, I don't know if she might have fell asleep or something. Are you, are you guys connected on Facebook? Yeah. Okay, so I think she sent me a Facebook invite like a few weeks ago, and uh -huh. typically if I get one from a woman that I don't know, or especially a married woman, I'm just going to ignore it. Right. Um, so I just, I don't know, if you if you catch her and she doesn't jump on, let her know. That's that's just my, my rule of thumb, so I don't, uh, you know, get in a compromising situation. Right. No, completely understand. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I want to apologize to all you guys for... Um, for missing out randy you got two screens on you know that or is that just because you got the second laptop yeah you know i i think it's not the laptop but i think it's the connection so i'm going to kill one okay i mean you're fine i just i didn't know if you knew it was both on so yeah anyways i want to apologize to you guys for missing i uh, i actually thought it was tuesday when it was wednesday i was working on bible translation i um kind of had an off week just because of the holidays just not working my normal schedule and then i had a little bit of a corona scare the the family I spent Christmas with, a couple of people came down with it, and I started to get a little, little bit of a headache and stuff. And I thought I might have it, but it turned out just to be dehydration, and I was fine within a day. So, um, but yeah, I was just a little, little off my timing, and I just thought it was the wrong day last week. So, um, as far as where we left off, what Michael, do you remember what passages I said I was going to add in? Um. We was going to do Revelation 1 through 3, and also the, um, what was it? You remember, Brandon? Uh, Joel 2. Yeah, Joel. Um, the former rain, latter rain. Former latter rain, yeah. Okay, and we can probably, well, yeah, I want to do that. I want to do that now because... Um, I've been I've been working on translating stuff. I was just you know working on refreshing James for that, and hopefully you guys. Hopefully I'll have that done in like ninety days, and um, that'll be like a chronological New Testament. But um, anyways, I'm realizing how James and Peter one is they're really close, right? They're both in Jerusalem, and really up until Peter goes to Rome right before he dies, like the squad in Jerusalem is Peter, James, and John. They're like the leaders, right? And then you've got like Paul and Timothy and Luke, um, you know, and Silas and Barnabas joining them outside of Jerusalem. Those are the main people. So, um, but uh, I wanted to get into those passages because those passages are kind of like what framed the church age. 
And when we get into Revelation 2 through 3, that's really going to be like the history of the church from really from beginning to end. And then it's going to overlap a little bit with the end times. Is this Rhea? Hey, hello, everybody. Hey, I'm Aaron. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sorry about missing last week. I was a little off kilter with the holidays and I got a little sick. So, um, That's okay. yeah, well, thank you for joining us. And then I, I, I let Michael know too, I, I did get your Facebook invitation, I think a few weeks ago. Generally speaking, if if I don't, if it's a woman I don't know or a married woman that I don't know, then I don't <laughs> accept it because I do get some strange women that are sometimes, you know, soliciting or things like that on Facebook. Um, but yeah, if you want to just let anyone else know, typically, typically, you know, if anyone else is interested, um, they can ask on YouTube. Okay. And usually, if they're just if they're on any of the videos and they're just asking on the comments. Um, I'll point them to the studies we've already done. And then once they've gotten okay. through those, they can join us. Okay, okay. Yeah, but thank you very much for, for joining us. I'm glad you're interested. Um, what we're going to do right now is we're, I'm going to do a really quick refresher on the things that we've talked through. And then we're going to get into some of the things the epistles said about the former reign and the latter reign and show how that kind of frames the church age. And then we'll get into the actual book of Revelation. So um, with that other stuff we added, we'll probably just get through chapter one of the Revelation now, and then, and then um, next week start on chapter two. But we'll just see how far we get. Um, so for starters, uh, just just to refresh, we we're looking at um, you, know, you know again going back to Luke seventeen, we're looking at um, how just just how Adam died spiritually and died physically. The kingdom of Israel um, has a spiritual kingdom come and a material kingdom come, just like we have a spiritual being born again and then a physical being born again when we receive our new bodies. So, so that pattern, we're always kind of looking for that framework and, and we're looking for that as, as an option to understand prophecies that people might be divided on their meaning. They might both be true. So um, we do that to try to you know bridge those gaps and make sure we're not discarding one one interpretation for the other because um, they can both be true and we have biblical examples of that and then um, we talked about how in Matthew 24 um, Jesus talks about all these signs that would precede the coming of the end which is apostasy and false prophets and false Christ and wars and ethnic conflicts and famines plagues earthquakes persecution signs in the heaven is the big one um, but these are all still not yet the end we're going to see the gospel preached everywhere um, at the end, we're going to have the abomination of desolation. That's the big sign. And then um, Christ is going to appear in the clouds and rapture the church. So um, that's what that's the plainest reading. That's the order we have it and understanding. And then we went forward from there into Daniel's teachings because uh, Jesus told us to understand Daniel, to understand the abomination of desolation. We showed how there are um, four kingdoms that are going to arise. And these kingdoms are these essentially gentile kingdoms that are kind of babysitting israel or stewarding israel while israel is brought to repentance by god and throughout the course of that there these four kingdoms are always going to have a pattern of being babylon then medio persia then greece and then rome but rome has the second phase which we would call the new world order or the antichrist empire um but but that's the the beast empire in the last days and so as we see that, and then we know God gives Daniel another prophecy, and he has these 70 weeks of years, and he has 62 weeks that lead up to Messiah being cut off, but not for himself. So we know the death of Messiah is the end of the 69th week, and now we have this mysterious church age that pops up, which is going to be between the 69th and 70th week. And God is frequently doing things like this because what he is usually doing is he's he's actually delaying the expected judgment and um and then he's he's actually supplying more mercy and more opportunity for people to repent so we see god doing frequent this frequently in history and we're, we're never re presuming on that mercy from god we 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 don't want to do that because that's usually when it comes to get you uh, unexpectedly is when you start to presume that god's just going to be gracious again and um, and then you use that as a license for immorality. But we do see that um, God is frequently in the business of um, seeming to change his mind and then um, delaying his wrath. 
but but then when we study the prophecies, we, we understand in hindsight that God was always planning on doing that thing, but he kept it veiled in a mystery because he obviously didn't want us to just be lax in our in our obedience to him. So um so that's kind of where we are as we've, you know, in, in terms of getting to the New Testament, Christ has just been cut off. And that's when we're going to get into Peter. Um, and really, this is his first public sermon. And if you can imagine, Christ would have died and rose from the dead. And he would have told them he would have spent three days in the grave. And then he would have spent 40 days um, showing himself to the apostles and meeting them several times. And then he ascends. And so we're waiting up until Pentecost and we're, so we're now 43 days from Pentecost and then they had to wait one more week um, for, for the feast of Pentecost. And that's when the Holy spirit fell down on them. So um, that's going to correspond to in the old Testament, that the time from Passover to them receiving the law on Mount Sinai, it's going to be the exact same dates between the Passover and the law and between Christ's death and resurrection and or his death and the, uh, the Holy Spirit being poured out. So we're now in Acts chapter two. The Holy Spirit has just been uh, poured out. And um, who, wants to, who wants to take a turn reading today? I can read. Okay. So let's start on chapter 14. People who just got done mocking them for speaking in tongues and have just received the Holy Spirit. And go ahead and read 14. Down, I'm going to take all the all the other things out. Maybe 14 down to um, verse 40. Okay. All right. So Acts chapter two. My mouth's working. Acts chapter two, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, "Ye men of Judea." And all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the, that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God have raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, Thou hast made me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus ha hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. 
for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saved himself, saved himself. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying save yourselves from this untoward generation okay so one of these days once we're through revelation that we'll we'll pick apart all the theology and what he just said there but there is enough theology in what peter just said there that if you pay attention carefully to what he said you could pretty much tear down almost everything that you would get from Reform theology, Roman Christendom, like all these bad doctrines that have crept in the church over the years. Because I mean, it like this, the fruit of his loins according to his flesh. You know, have you ever heard somebody say that Jesus couldn't have been of the actual flesh of humankind because otherwise he would have sin? <laughs> well, right? Okay. Just says the fruit of his loins according to the flesh, right? Right. So so consequently, both Mary and Joseph were were of the line of david um even though mary was at a virgin birth the actual substance of jesus christ's flesh was human right um i mean you, you can't get around that but you know and he was born into corruptible flesh but this is why people have all these um philosophically wrong ideas about original sin and stuff like that and what that means you know like technically um, and they, they apply all this human understanding to it. And then they come out with all these other rules about whether or not babies, you know, like unborn children can go to heaven and, you know, whether or not you should baptize an infant to get them into heaven. And, you know, so all these bad ideas would creep in over the years because of these certain things. And, and you'll find out a lot of these bad ideas were very old and crept in. So we'll, we won't get into all that right now, but I would just say if, if you... I, I, I would say, listen to what Peter says, because this is the first ever anointed gospel call by the Holy Spirit. And there's so much in there that the church disregards in terms of understanding when, when Peter is literally saying, you know, right here, save yourselves from this untoward generation. He's giving them, this is how you get saved, right? And there's so much in here that so many different church groups that will, will ignore because it doesn't fit their denominational paradigm. So um, I want to just get into the part about the, the former and the latter rain, though. So we didn't hear anything about the former and the latter rain here, but what, what did we hear out of Joel? Does the darkness, the moon turning into blood before the great notable day of the Lord, the okay. sun turned to darkness? So starting in verse 17, he's, he's, he's quoting Joel here, right? Yeah. And, um, oops, that's the wrong one. So he's, he's point, he's pointing to Joel second, but, but. You, here, here's your hint about rain, right? I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall dream vision. Dream, I'm sorry, your, your, your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions and your old men dream dreams. Now, are any of these things happening right now? Yeah. Which ones? Um, all of them that you just read? Yeah, right, right here, right now. You said um, in verse 17? Yeah. Yeah. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and young men shall see vision, and old men shall dream dreams. What do we have in the text? You said all flesh. 
but but I'm saying what what is what is happening in the text on verse four here, right? Mm -hmm. So, do you see anyone dreaming dreams or having visions? Yeah. What what, what do you see? Where where's a dream? Oh, you mean in the text? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking you're talking about like in in the world <laughs> right well and that's why we're again we're 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 this is going to be a discipline we're going to keep getting back to which is what does the text say because we're just thinking in terms of what they have in front of them right right i got you so so they're speaking in tongues that's a form of prophecy we know that right mm -hmm. okay so we know there's sons and daughters prophesying um but um, we don't see we don't see any reference to anyone having visions or dreaming dreams here, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's a kind of a hint that we're not just talking about this one incident here, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about probably a progression of things going forward because we know there are later in the Book of Acts we have you know dreams and visions and things, but right now all, all the only thing we have is speaking in tongues and glorifying God, which would be kind of like prophesying, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so he says that. And then he says, and on my servants and my maid maidens, I will pour out in those days. See where he says those days. Excuse me. Of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Now, if I'm going to get technical based on things that we've talked about, what, what do you think What do you think those days mean? What is, what is at a minimum, what does those days have to be? Last, last days. Right, but if I say if I say those days, how many how many days does there have to be at least? More than one day. Right, so at least two days, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now he's saying, and this is what we're we're getting into the specificity of days, right? Because if I'm saying those days, I hear at least two days. Now, prophetically, I'm going to say that is only two days. Okay, because. If you get into the millennium, which is the third day, if we're talking thousand year day, um, prophecy ceases. And right. we'll, we'll get into that later on. But there's Zechariah and in Corinthians, um, it refers to prophecy and in Daniel, prophecy ceasing in the millennium. Okay. So when he's saying those days prophetically, remember, we're all, we always have the option of thinking days as a general span of time or days as in, you know, how we would normally think of days, or days as thousand year days, right? So it just so happens, if we think of it as thousand year days, it would fit this prophecy, right? If there's 2000 years, right? So that's a stretch of the imagination for me to go there from there, but I'm gonna show you once we go full circle, that's technically what those days means. So let's look at this. Because th this is what I want to show you is that when, when they say things, they're speaking by the Holy Spirit. And even though the Holy Spirit speaks in ways that are mysterious, he's actually incredibly precise in what he's saying. So he says, then he says, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood, fire and vapors of smoke. Okay. So. And then he says, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon turned to blood before the great notable day of the Lord come. Okay. So we have a list of things. We have wonders in heaven, signs on the earth. Okay. That's, that's the general expression of everything that's happening, right? Wonders in the heaven and signs on the earth. Okay. So that's your, your heading. Okay. Now we have blood, fire, and vapors of smoke. And we have the sun turned into darkness and the moon turned into blood. Okay. So he just lists five things. Okay. So these have to be wonders in heaven above and what wonders on the earth below. Which ones of those are in the heaven above? The sun and the moon. The sun and the moon, right? Which ones are on the earth below? Uh, smoke, fire. Right. Blood, fire, and vapor of smoke, right? So in order for that to be this prophecy to, to be containing all those things, you have to have all those things before the great no notable day of the Lord comes. Now, based on what we've studied already, when is the great no notable day of the Lord? At the midpoint of the of Dane's week. Okay. So based on what he's saying, 
let's just assume I'm, I'm going to qualify this, but so, so you guys are, I want you to be skeptical and doubting that I'm saying this. Let's say if those days is exact is 2000 years minimum. Okay. And we have to see the sun turn to darkness, the moon turn to blood, blood, fire, and vapors of smoke before that 2000 years is up at a minimum. I'm not saying it can't be longer than that, but at a minimum, it has to be that. Okay. Now we know what he's talking about here with the pouring out of spirit, not all those spiritual gifts happen right then and there. Right. Right. So that's going to expand forward in the future, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So then we also know that these other things aren't happening right now, right? So that spans forward in the future. Okay. So just by simple process of elimination, if we say those days and, you know, let's say years pass from when Peter said this and all these things didn't happen, we can eliminate that interpretation, right? Right. If it didn't happen in the next few days, right? It, it's, we know the literal days interpretation. Now, we could probably keep the general those days in terms of like that age or that era of time, right? Right. Right. And, and based on what I'm telling you, we could have the 2000 years in there, but I, we, we, we've got to scrutinize that to see because all these things have to happen before a minimum 2000 years. Okay. So, so that's what he's talking about. And then he says, after, after that, the, here's the great notable day of, the, day of the Lord, and it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So um, apparently whoever calls on the name of the Lord by this time is saved. Okay. So that's the general prophecy that, that Peter is saying, this is that. Okay. So at a minimum, we know that this is that and those days starts with what peter just mentioned these people speaking in tongues and ends with all these signs at, at least right if this is that right okay so those days has to have all that in it okay so does anyone know just off the cuff when the sun turns to darkness and the moon turns to blood in revelation six seal Six seal, okay. What about when blood and fire and vapor of smoke happen? That's later. Mm -hmm. Oh no, uh, it's there's a partial in the seals, I believe. Uh, I don't actually see any of these in Revelation six. Okay. But when you get to Revelation eight with the trumpets, um, one of them turns the rivers to blood. One of them turns the third of the seas to blood. Remember that. Yeah, there's a partial. Um, yep, and then and then a mountain like fire burns and and like all the green grass is burned up and the trees are burned up. Remember that? Yeah. And then you have uh, smoke coming up out of the bottomless pit and all the locusts coming up out it. Remember that? Yep. All right. So at a minimum, all these things are going to take you to into now that one with the smoke. That was actually I think the um, the fifth trumpet. Okay. So all this stuff is going to take you up to two trumpets before the rapture right the seventh trumpet is the rapture okay so that takes you the whole two thousand years okay now i'm just giving you that one reference and then the book of revelation and saying that but i'm going to show you how everything's going to tie into that okay so we're going to start out and we're going to go to um joel chapter two which is where he was And uh, before he gets into his um, pouring out his spirit in all flesh, this is what he's quoting is verse 28. He's going to say this. He's going to talk about a great northern army coming on them. And then he's going to say the earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army for his camp is very great. And he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and terrible, and who can abide it? And so it looks like here that the day of the Lord is about to arrive. And then he says, therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye everyone to me, even with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, 
and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great and repenteth him of the evil. Okay. Remember I was just talking about how God, it's a characteristic that God reveals having over and over again, right? Like if he's about to do harm to a nation because of their sin and they repent, he's going to repent from the harm he was going to do. And that's right in uh, the book of Jeremiah. He, he says that. So then he says this, who will know if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering to the Lord, your God. Now, if we think of this in New Testament eyes, what's the meat offering and drink offering? Uh, bread and wine. Yeah. Body of Christ. Blood right. of Christ. The body of Christ. And it's a drink offering unto the Lord your God, right? So if you understand the Jews' expectation of Christ prophetically, what were they expecting from Christ in his first coming? Military leadership, like a savior to lead them from like captivity. Right. And Soraya, did you say something? I, I'm... Uh, a physical kingdom? Yeah, the physical kingdom and a military conquest, right? But in this prophecy, we've got a military conquest coming, right? Right. Mm -hmm. but, but who's he coming against? Yeah. Now, in, in this prophecy right here, do you know who he's coming against? Yeah, the ones that are supposed to rip their clothes and repent. Right. What is, verse 1, it says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land trouble for the day the Lord is at near. So who is this army of judgment coming against? Israel. Israel, right? Yep. This is what Israel doesn't really get, that when the day of the Lord comes, and if you read the prophets, he's saying this over and over and over again. He's saying, woe to you who want the day. This is in Amos. He says, woe to you who want the day of the Lord to come, because it's a terrible day. And he's basically saying, because it's the day of your judgment. It's it, yeah, it's the day of the judgment of the Gentiles, but it's the day of your judgment too, because what that represents is God's judgment against all sin and all flesh, right? So they don't know this yet, but they need to be in Christ to be saved from that judgment, right? So he's talking about the day of the Lord and his camp coming, right? And and if you understand the prophecies in Daniel and the things leading up to that day. Um, when they, they're expecting their Messiah, they're like, yes, the day of the Lord's coming, that's when we'll triumph. And it's like, no, that's when you'll die. So you need to be saved in Christ by that day. Um, and so, so he gives them this, this, um, this army coming forward, and then he tells them to rend their heart and not their garments and turn to the Lord for he is gracious and mer merciful. And then they say, who knows if he will repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and drink offering unto the Lord your God. So the short story of this is, if when you're expecting the judgment of God to come, you need to be the one to repent. And if you do, maybe he'll leave behind a meat offering unto the Lord your God. In other words, a sacrifice that will satisfy God, right? So he's, mm -hmm. he's, he is prophetically and mystically talking about Christ coming as the offering instead of the wrath of God coming. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, so that's the mystical version. That's the all. Remember, there's the, there's going to be an already not yet version of that. Okay. That's the spiritual version of it. And so he talks about blowing a trumpet in Zion and calling a fast and uh, gathering the people. And then he says, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck at the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride from her closet. Now, if we're looking at that with New Testament eyes, who's the bridegroom and the bride? It's in the church. Christ in the church, right? So, so if if you're a faithful Jew who's repentant, what do you want to happen as as a as the fruit of that repentance? Think bridegroom and bride. Well, let's let's start here. Let the bridegroom go out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Are they so the in different rooms or are they in the same room? Different rooms. They're in different rooms. Different rooms. So where would this be in, re in respect to a wedding? 
beginning, middle, end, or hasn't even started yet? That that hasn't started yet. What what now? When when we think about this, where are they? If you're in a wedding and a bride's in his chamber, or bridegroom's in his chamber, and the and or the bride is in her closet, and the bridegroom is in his chamber, where are we in the wedding? Right before the ceremony of marriage. Right, it's the preparation stage, right? Mm -hmm. So typically, in 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 the in the groom in the groom's chamber, what's going on with the groom's chamber? Well, he's getting himself together. He's prepping himself, as well as the bride in her chamber, in her closet. Right, and who's helping the bride? The Holy Spirit. Well, I'm not not that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Who's helping the bride in the literal wedding? Bridesmaids. Bridesmaids, right? Right. Do you remember what Jesus called his disciples when they accused him him and his disciples of never fasting? How can they fast uh, when the groom is here? Right, but what did he what did he call them? Do you remember? The children. Um, it was about the wedding, uh, but I don't remember. He called them the children of the bride chamber. There we go. So what are the children of the bride chamber? What, what would we call them? We just said it. Are those groomsmen? No. They, the grooms ain't going to be caught dead in the bride chamber, are they? No. That's a violation. <laughs> so who, who are the children of the bride chamber? Those who are preparing the bride. Right. They're the bridesmaids, right? Right. So he referred to his Jewish disciples, the apostles, as, as the bridesmaids, right? Mm. And what's their job? To, to get the bride ready. To get the bride ready, right? And so the repentant Jews are saying, let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride from her closet. Why are they saying that? because it's time right when see when these two come together the bride and the bridegroom that's when their salvation comes so see how they're saying who knows if he will return and repent and leave a drink offering behind him and then they call a solemn assembly and fast and they gather the congregation together all these people and then what do they say all together let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride from their closet because in their repentance, when the Jews finally repent and receive Christ, they're going to realize our salvation comes when the bride and bridegroom are together. So when the church is raptured, that's when their salvation comes, okay? So we don't know this because this is way back in Joel, but we have this cryptic reference to the rapture way back in Joel. So they're looking for the rapture because that's when Jesus will pour out wrath on their behalf versus on them does that make sense mm -hmm. uh -huh. so, so he this is the repentance that he's calling them to and then he says let the priests the ministers of the lord weep between the porch and the altar and and let them say spare thy people O lord and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them remember they're in the times of the gentiles right right where or should they say among their people where is their god so so what they're calling for is the end of the times of the Gentiles when the bridegroom and the bride come together. Does that make sense? So the heathen are no longer ruling over them at that time. Okay. So we have two things. We have the rapture of the church and the end of the times of the Gentiles. And then it says, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Okay. And then he says, yea, the Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you corn, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied therewith, and I will make you a reproach no longer among the heathen. Now, these terms here, corn, wine, and oil, I mean, when we looked at this in the chapter before, there's actual physical famine. But if we look at that with New Testament eyes, what, is, what does corn represent? Then can, is anything popping out to you from Christ's teachings? Well, we get uh, wheat and the chaff. Uh, this is something that's edible. It's real. Right. So this is this wouldn't be yellow corn like our corn. When they say corn, they mean kernels of wheat, right? Mm -hmm. 
So corn, there's another prophecy Jesus says, remember in John, where he says, unless a kernel dies and falls into the ground, it bears nothing. Um, but when it grows, it bears fruit, right? And so that seed bearing fruit, what is what what about wine? Can you think of anything in Christ's teachings about that? Not putting old wine into you know, new yeah. wine skin. New wine skin. So what did that represent there? What did wine represent in Christ's teaching there? New covenant. New covenant, right? Versus the old. What about oil? oil Anointing. Oil. Right. Anointed with what? A spirit. Spirit, right? So we have the seed bearing fruit. That's the word. We have the new covenant. And we have the Holy Spirit. Okay, so mm -hmm. now now listen to what he's saying with spiritual eyes. He's saying, okay, you're looking for the bride and groom to be gathered together, and you're looking for um, the heathen to stop ruling over you, right? Now look at this. Remember, we have already not yet. We have the spiritual, and then we have the material later on, okay? In the spiritual sense, if you're a repentant Jew, are the heathen still ruling over you? Yeah. In the New Testament, in New Covenant? Oh, you said in the spiritual sense? In the spiritual sense. No. No. Okay. Um, in the spiritual sense, are the bride and groom together? Yes. Yes. Okay. In the spiritual sense, do we have corn, wine, and oil? Yes. Yes. Okay. So all those things are fulfilled in the New Covenant, right? If you're saved. Remember, if yeah, to, to, he says, to whom uh, shall receive it, John is the Elijah to come, right? So in the spiritual sense, all those things are fulfilled. We have all that. And he says, I will make you no more reproach among the heathen. We have all that. In the physical sense, are any of those things fulfilled? No. Material, no. When will all those things be, be fulfilled? Um, millennial reign? Right. So, I mean, you're talking about actual corn, wine, and oil, actual not being reproached among the heathen, the bride and groom being physically together, right? And then there's, it will, we can also be looking for this physical great northern army at some point in time, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So he says, I will remove from you the northern army and I will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face towards the east sea and his hinder part towards the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he has done great things. Now we'll get into all this again when we get into Revelation 6. Uh, and the Gog Magog and the Red Horse and all that. Um, but this is the end of a physical war, okay? So then he says, fear not, O land, and be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, and the tree beareth their fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength, okay? So he's talking about Israel bearing fruit in the last days, okay? Because now we're talking about this great army being defeated, okay? Then he says, be, be glad ye then, children of Zion, and rejoice in your God, for he has given you, right here, he says, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause you to come down the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month, okay? So what do you think the former rain moderately means? What well, we read in Acts 2. Right. See, why do you think the word moderately is there? It's progressive type of yeah we didn't see all those signs and everything that comes with it it's right not people it's not every all men all women right see so you hear what randy said when we think moderate it's kind of mild right mm -hmm. so how many people received the holy spirit on that day 120, Ooh, 3, 000, 120 right, right? Mm -hmm. and then well then there were three thousand added to them right Right. right. But but how many is that out of Israel though? You know, percent. Yeah, do you know what the population of Israel would have been around that time? <laughs> no. It it probably would have been in the millions. And right there in Jerusalem and Judea, there'd probably been at least quarter to a half a million Jews. So three million is like a drop in the bucket, or three thousand is like a drop in the bucket, right? Right. So now, so, so he points out moderately because the first 
instance of this rain pouring down is going to be moderate. But then he says the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. What do you think the latter rain is? That would be the 144,000. Right. And, and how many Jews come to faith at their preaching, do you know? A lot more than 144,000. Right. We'll, we'll get into that well, later. One third. Too. One third in Zechariah. Exactly. It's one third. So, so now, um, total population, there's about 16 million Jews in the, in, in the world. If one third of them get saved, how many is that? Five and a third million. Right. So we go from less than 5,000 to over 5 million. See, so that's why that first rain is just moderate. Okay. So th then he says, and then the floor, the floors, remember we talked about corn, wine, and oil, right? And the floors will be full of wheat and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. See what he's saying now? So he's telling you this, this outpouring of the spirit in the former rain is going to be kind of mild at first, but the later one is going to be great because he, mm. he's, he's saving a remnant of in the beginning, but in the end, he's going to save a third of the whole nation. Okay. Then he says, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has uh, dealt wonderfully with you and my people will never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and I am your, the Lord your God and no one else and my people shall never be ashamed. Now, spiritually, is this true for us right now? Yes. Yes. Physically, is it true now? I am in the midst of Israel. No. Yeah. Jesus is not physically there. So so this is an already not yet thing, right? Correct. So then he says, and it shall come to pass afterward. Okay. So after after what? After the spiritual fulfillment of all these things or the literal fulfillment of all these things? Spiritual. Spiritual. Moderately, right? So when we look at what happened in the book of Acts with 120 people speaking in tongues and prophecy, can we see how that's just a moderate fulfillment of, of all these things that are happening? Yeah. So then he says all these things that lead up to really all this is the, the day of the Lord. Okay. It's going to lead up to the seventh trumpet and God pouring out his wrath. But we know that there's a greater version of this coming later on. And that's what we're looking for in the latter rain. So um, I put this down. We, 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 we haven't really expressly gotten into the gap between the 69th and 70th week yet, because the, the Jews are really just in that 69th week. The death of Christ just happened. So they're really like a month past that, right? Um, what they're going to come to learn is that there's this former rain and there's this latter rain here, okay? And within that, we have the mystery of the Gentiles, and that mystery is going to be the children of the bride chamber, which are the Jewish disciples of Christ preparing the bride, which is the Gentiles. Okay. So check this out. Between John the Baptist ministry and Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, we have three and a half years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then 120 get saved. And then obviously they lead to others getting saved. In the latter reign, we're going to have 12,000 from 12 tribes. That's how you get the 144,000. And then you're going to have three and a half years of ministry by who? The Jews. So 144,000. Them, but who, who else with them? Oh, Elijah and um, Moses. Moses, right? So check this out. Jesus was called a prophet like unto Moses in Deuteronomy, right? Yep. Uh -huh. John the Baptist is who? Elijah. Elijah, okay. So you have a prophet like Moses and a spiritual Elijah for three and a half years ministering, okay? And then you have the former reign, right? Right. So uh, now you're going to have the latter reign, and then you're going to have Moses and Elijah ministering again, okay? And this is, the, this is what's so ironic about this, right? What were the Jews who crucified Christ always saying to him? They said, we follow who? Moses. Moses, right? 
what happens to actual Moses when actual Moses shows up in the tribulation? They're not going to follow him. They kill him, right? Yeah. The Antichrist does, but that's their leader, right? So we have John and Jesus, and then we have Elijah and Moses, but also the church and the 144,000 witnesses. So this is a much bigger, much broader testimony, right? That's not moderate. And, and in the interim of this, we have a delay in God's wrath. So the delay didn't actually start when Christ died. The delay started when Christ started preaching. Do you remember when Christ first came out and preached in Luke 4, what he said? I talk about it in my videos all the time. Yeah, he quoted Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And then cut it off. Cut it off halfway through the verse. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's this right here, but the 69th week of Daniel is at the end of that three and a half years, okay? The 70th week of Daniel is at the beginning of this three and a half years, but the delay in the wrath is in the middle. So see how you have the delay in God's wrath has that extra seven years on either end of it? Mm -hmm. But the um, 70th week of Daniel has the gap for what I'm going to show you is 2,000 years, okay? But do you see how it's such a crisp, clean pattern when you put it all together? Right. Okay, so so God knows what he's doing. It's like he worked this out. It's like he had some time to plan. <laughs> so when we get into Revelation, we're going to talk about the seven churches, and we'll get probably a little bit more deeply into this next one because we're probably going to stick to this latter reign for most of our session right now. Um, you have Christ crucified on the cross, and he goes up in the clouds. He's raptured, right? Then we have the former rain come down, and then we have these seven periods, and then at the end, right, right really in the midst of the sixth and the seventh period, you have the latter rain, and then three and a half years later, the church goes up. So they're not exactly, because Christ, you know, the former rain happened just like a week after Christ happened here, right? But the latter rain happens three and a half years after this. Um, but there's going to be this pattern in the church. And I'm, the reason I have it kind of in a pyramid like this is because um, there's a mirror to what's going on here. And the high point of everything that's worldly about the church and Roman Catholicism is kind of in the middle. And then these are going to reflect what's on the either side of it. And we're going to see this pattern come back. So we'll get into that more when we get into the seven churches. But for right now, we're looking at this former reign, this latter reign. So uh, Joel was not the only person who um, mentions his former reign and latter reign. If, if you want to guess, who, who else do you think is going to mention it in, in, the, in the New Testament? Paul? Oh. Nope. Paul mentions the mystery, which goes on in the middle. He doesn't talk about the former reign and latter reign. Who's the former reign and the latter reign primarily referencing to? Um, Jews or Gentiles? So, Jews. So Jews. Peter? Well, so we know Peter. Who do you, who do you think is the other one? Who's, who's the other main guy when you think Jews? James. James. So let's go to James. So what's the main theme of James of what you're talking about? If you had to break down a summary of what James is about, what, what's the main thing that it's about? We're going to bear fruits. It's like, say like conduct. Yep. Right at the beginning, he says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith produces what? Patience. Patience, okay? So this is, this is the point about James, because remember, the Jews were expecting the kingdom to come at that time, right? Mm -hmm. And so James is exhorting the Jews, and he probably writes this right after Stephen gets stoned, and then the Jews are getting scattered abroad, and then they're, they're now losing their jobs and they're starting to be poor for the first time. And he's now just starting to encourage the church to take care of each other in these remote places because this is going to be a while, okay? So he goes through this book and at the end of the book, he says this. He says, Be also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near, okay? Okay. And he says, grudge not against one another, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands at the door. That's right out of the book of Revelation. Then he says, take my brother and the prophets who you have spoken of in the name of the Lord and is an example of suffering, affliction, and patience. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. You have heard of the patience of 
Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, brethren, swear not, neither by heaven nor by earth, nor, nor under any other oath, and let your yea be yea, and your nay yea, nay, unless you fall into temptation. Condemnation. Or, I'm sorry, condemnation, I'm sorry. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Uh, let him sing psalms. Is there any sick among you? Let the elders of the church, uh, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then here's an example of that. Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the space of the earth for how long? Three and a half years. Three and a half years, right? So he, he finishes his epistle about them being patient, talking about Elijah making it not rain for three and a half years. What happens in the first half of the tribulation? <laughs> you know? The two witnesses Damn stopped it, right? from raining for the three and a half years of their ministry. Okay? And one of them is Elijah. And it says, and then he prayed again, and the heaven gave, gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit, okay? He said, brethren, do not any of you err from the truth if one convert him. Let him know that he which converts the sinner of the error of his ways shall save his soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Um, oh, I, I missed that. I'm sorry. I, I skipped something. Right here, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Hmm. So James is referencing that same thing. But then they're not going to be the only two that reference it because um, we know it's in Joel, but it's actually in another prophet that's very important too. So if we go to Hosea chapter 5, and just so you know, if you start in Hosea chapter 3, it starts talking about this. This is, this is the theme of Hosea. He says, For Israel will abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod, without a teraphim. Okay? When would all those things be fulfilled? Destruction of the temple. Right. Because they, they might have been without a king, but they had King Herod. They had princes, they had sacrifices, they had an ephod and teraphim up until 70 AD, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, so they're going to abide many days, okay? Then he says, afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days, okay? So this prophecy is going to continue and then it kind of reaches a crescendo at chapter 5. And he says... Ephraim is Joseph's eldest son. So for the northern kingdom, Ephraim was a summary for Israel, just like Judah is for the Jews in southern Israel. And so he says, I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away and will take away and none shall rescue him. Rescue him. Now, did Jesus tear them? Oh, yeah. It was what, what did it always say when, whenever Jesus said something convicting to them? What did it always say their response was? Uh, what did Jesus say? Yeah, when Jesus said heart. something to the Jews that convicted them, what, how, how did they respond? What did the text say? Do you remember? They were pricked to the heart. They were pricked to the heart or cut to the heart, right? Mm -hmm. That's his tearing. What's his going away representing? It's ascending to the Father. Right. So he says, I will take away and none shall rescue him, okay? And he says, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. What's another word for affliction? We talked about that in Matthew 24. Tribulation, Tribulation right? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think their offense is? They rejected Christ. Right, they're denying the Lord, right? Yep. So he's going to return to his place as Christ's ascension until they call on the name of the Lord, right? In the tribulation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. 
So now we get into chapter six and he says, come, this, this is now the Jews responding to him. He says, come and let us return to the Lord for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. What do you think that's referencing? Two days, two years. The resurrection? Yep, 2,000 years and then the resurrection, okay? And then he says, then we shall know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come to us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain on earth. There you go. The Lord's coming has this former and latter rain around it, right? First coming, former rain, latter rain, second coming. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. So, so that's that prophecy, and uh, you can even go back further than Hosea. Hosea is actually one of the older prophets. Um, oops, that's not it. Uh, it's actually, bear with me here. Well, that's Jeremiah. It's in there, but that's not it. The first mention of it is in Deuteronomy. And the Lord says this. He says, it will come to pass that if you hearken diligently to my commandments, which I command you this day to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and all your soul, that I will give you the rain of the land in this due season, the, the first rain and the latter rain that you may gather what? Corn. <laughs> and wine and oil oh, wow <laughs> so whenever whenever you get to like one of these key phrases that you're going to hear in a prophecy always go back and try to figure out the first time you heard that in the bible okay because it's usually something that god is saying and when he says it you're like oh yeah okay so we're gonna have a uh, good farming right we obey the lord and in that in the material sense, right, in the old covenant, that they would have, you know, if they obeyed the Lord's commandment, they'd have good farming, right? But there was a bigger, fuller spiritual fulfillment to that always from the beginning, okay? So so now we have we have two days, right? We have the former and the latter rain. We have the corn, wine, and oil, which is essentially the new covenant summarized. Um do we have proof that a day is a thousand years yet in the Old Testament? What was the question? Um, the, the day being a thousand years, can we pull that out of the Old Testament? Remember, we're not, we haven't gotten to Peter saying a day is like a thousand years yet because that's Psalm, later on in history. Psalm 90. Right, Psalm 90. Mm -hmm. So we go to Psalm 90. Psalm of Moses. And how long have the Jews had this psalm? Since, Since Moses. Days of Moses. Since Moses, right? Same as Deuteronomy, right? So it says, um, the Lord has been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth, or ever hast thou had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest a man to destruction, sayest, return to the children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight is but yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. So, do you know how many watches there are on a night? I can guess. Seven? Oh. <laughs> Two? Um, morning watch. Let's see. Either seven or two. Um, I think it's three or four, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the night, I think each each watch is two or three hours, and I'm trying to figure out which one where it is. Let's see if I can find fourth watch.
Oh, there you go. Matthew 14, 25. And the fourth watch of the night, he just went unto them walking in the sea. Okay. Mm. And then we actually we got two witnesses. Look at that. Mark 6, 48. About the fourth watch, he came to them walking on the sea. Okay. Um, what's the sea represent prophetically? Gentiles. Gentiles. Okay. So at the fourth watch. Okay. Now check this out. Um, another thing Jesus said. Nope. We'll get to those living creatures in a second. But um, oh, why is that just the Old Testament there? Oh, I'm sorry. I know why. with me and close all this stuff. So we got four watches. Did Jesus die? It was at uh, noon to three. Is that correct? That's like. I think it was around three or four p.m. I, I don't know if that necessarily ties into this. Um. Mark sixteen fifteen. He says, "Go and go and preach the gospel to every creature." Right. So we've got creatures representing the Gentiles. You can preach to every creature. And then we have a second witness to that in Acts uh, 10 when Peter gets the, um, remember the sheep lowered down to him with all the living creatures on it? Uh -huh. And um, after he comes out of his vision, the Holy Spirit tells him to go to these two Gentiles. Right. Where am I? And he says this. He says, wherein he found all manner. The, here, here's, here's the uh, the the vessel descending onto him, and it says it has been as a great sheet knit at the four corners. Now, when you hear four corners in the Bible, what does that usually represent? All over there, right? Let down to the earth, right? So you see four corners in earth, wherein were all four-footed beasts, wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of the air. Where does that sound sound like right there? Genesis. What'd you say? Genesis. Genesis, right in the beginning, right? In the beginning, we created things. So, yeah. so check this out now. Now, this this is just what a Jew would have access to before uh, before any of the New Testament was written. Okay. Um, how many watches did we say there was in a night? Four. Four, and we said a day is like what? A thousand years. A thousand years. Okay. Um, so we have in the first day God created the heaven and the earth, and it was dark, right? Mm -hmm. there was light but that light wasn't sunlight right right no, no sun. so we have uh a thousand years that's one watch and then he creates the firmament that's a thousand years that's the second watch and then he creates the the um the dry land and the and the uh tree yielding fruit that's the third watch and that's another thousand years and then he says in the fourth day let there be a firmament of heaven to describe for days and nights and let there be for signs and for seasons and for the days of the years. And let them be lights for the firmament in heaven to give light upon the earth. And God made two great lights, the greater to rule the day and the lesser to rule the night. And he made the stars also and set them in the firmament of heaven to light on the earth and to rule over the day and night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the first, were the fourth day. Okay. Mm -hmm. So check this out. If God made the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day, so that's the fourth watch of the night, right? Um, and it was evening and then was morning. When did they see the first sunrise? At the beginning of the day or the end of the day? The end. The end, right? Yep. At the end of the fourth watch, the night is over. The sun rises, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens at the end of 4,000 years? Christ comes. Christ comes. The sun of righteousness arises with healing in his wings, right? Mm-hmm. So that's just what they had. And, and this kind of stuff, just so you know, you can find rabbis that were like this close to getting it. Like, cause they studied like this. And I mean, you can find this in early church fathers and you can find this in the rabbis that were just like, there's Jews to this day, their calendar is all messed up, but they believe that there's 6,000 years and then the, the millennium seventh day of rest with the Lord. So, 
So now we have the sun rising at the end of the fourth watch at, after 4,000 years. Do you know how long it was between Adam and Christ exactly? 4,000. Exactly, right? If you yeah. do all the math in the Bible, it's exactly 4,000 years. Yeah. And then he says what happens on the, on the next two days. Remember the, the creatures that were in the blanket? Mm -hmm. So you had the fowls of the airs. Uh, let's see, the fowl that fly upon the, above the earth. You had the, the cattle, the four-footed cattle, the creeping things, and the beasts of the earth. All created in the next two days, right? Mm -hmm. So when Jesus says, go and spread the gospel to every creature, the reason he says every creature, not every man, is because the creatures are all the Gentiles for 2,000 years. Just like Hosea says, after two days, right? Mm -hmm. He will raise us up and we'll live in his sight. And so what's, on, what's the seventh day? day of rest the day of rest yes, the sabbath and the millennium right what jesus puts every rule under his feet so so we have all this in there already and then we have the former days and the latter days but not only that we had the thing that we talked about with adam right the already not yet paradigm where adam died spiritually but within a thousand years he died physically right right okay so now we're going to take this all the way forward to peter and second peter because this would have come way, this is before the revelation is written. Peter died in 64 AD. So just, just to give you a frame of reference, Acts chapter 2 was probably around 33 AD, maybe 34, but probably 33 AD. We are now 31 years after that, okay? Paul's written all his letters. He's done all his teaching on the mystery of the Gentiles being gathered in, right? And then um, now Peter's in Rome, Paul's in Rome, and they're both about to get killed by Nero, and Peter writes this letter. And remember, James's letter, James is already dead. James died in 62 AD. He was killed in Jerusalem, and he tells him to wait for the former and the latter reign, right? Mm -hmm. And Peter, before he dies, he sends this letter. Um, he says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fall, fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they were willingly ignorant of, that the word of, by the word of God, the heavens of old and the earth standing out of, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished. So he's talking about the flood, right? Mm-hmm. And he says, but the, the heavens and the earth, which are now are by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So now we're looking for a flood of fire. Okay. So he says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. Now, is Peter just saying that out of thin air? <laughs> no. No. See, and this is the thing about your average Christian and your average Gentile church today, we don't have any clue what they knew in the Old Testament because we just don't study the Old Testament hardly at all, right? Right. We don't know that he has a prophecy in Hosea and a prophecy in, um, in uh, Psalm 90 and all this stuff, right? So he says, a day with the Lord. This word is isn't even in there. He's saying one day with the Lord as a thousand years. And that literally could be translate. He could say that one day with the Lord, which is a thousand years. It literally can be translated that way. That one day with the Lord, which is a thousand years. Because this word hoss says, let's see. For unto the, unto the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, right? But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. So he, he's telling them that the day of judgment and perdition where the earth is destroyed by fire right that's the day right but remember this is the same peter who just said in acts those days referring to the 2000 years of the church age right, uh -huh. right? So now he's saying that day in reference to the day of the lord and he talks about the judgment of fire right so check this out he says he says um by the same word are kept in store re reserved unto fire unto the day 
because uh, when there's no uh, or the there, you can insert that the day of judgment, but it's only going to be one day and perdition of the ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant. It's this land, Lantho, uh, remember I told you when the words before and after. So he's saying, not you all ignorant. Okay, so ignorant, not you all ignorant is basically like saying, let none of you be ignorant. Okay. So ignorant, not you all ignorant. So let none of you be ignorant of, of this, of the one thing, this or one thing. Um, and then he says, that thing is that one day, the word is, is not there in the original, one day with the Lord. And this, this word can say, which, how, in that manner, about, after, according, as soon, even as, for, how, like, so that that to when while unto speed okay so so it literally could say which which is as a thousand years so that one day with the lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day so he's saying the day of judgment and destruction of fire is what they're being kept for by the lord right but he's telling them but don't be ignorant because that day is a thousand years does that make sense mm -hmm. Now your average reader in the church is they don't they don't incorporate Psalm 90, they don't incorporate all those prophecies we look at, and they're like, no, he's just using a general uh you know, figure of speech for God being patient. And it's like, well, he is talking about how patient God is, but he's also saying something specifically prophetic because he's prophesying about the Lord's second coming, right? So right. he's saying the earth is being kept in fire for the day of judgment, but that day is a thousand years. Okay. So now check this out. He says, the Lord, he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but rather is long-suffering unto us, not willing or not intending that any should perish or be destroyed, but rather that all come, or I'm sorry, all, this word would be have room unto repentance. So he's saying he is, he is willing, he, his intention is that all people have space to repent, okay? This word Correo is, is have space, okay, unto repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Um, then the elements shall melt with a fervent heat and also the works that are in shall be burned up, okay? So remember, Adam died immediately in the day that he he um, ate of the fruit, right? And a thousand years later, he died physically, right? Jesus Christ came to judge immediately when he shows up in his second coming, right? Mm -hmm. But that judgment isn't completed until the end of the millennium when he burns up the whole earth by fire and melts it with fervent heat, right? Right. So he just he is telling you if you understand the prophecies that he's referencing, he's saying. The earth is being re reserved for a flood of fire, just like the flood of Noah. And that day will come when Jesus comes to judge the earth. But don't be ignorant. That day is a thousand years. And in that day, he'll come as a thief in the night. And that the elements will burn in the, in the fervent heat. Now, listening to how he speaks, your average person is like, oh, wow, that's going to happen back to back, right? But we just listened to Peter in Acts chapter 2. He just talked about those days, and he talked about all those things like they were all together, right? But those days take place at over 2,000 years. This day takes place over 1,000 years. But he flat out told you this day is 1,000 years, see? So you have the code for how Peter thinks, even if you don't know Moses. Even if you just have the New Testament, you have the code to understand how Peter's how Peter's referencing these things. Now check this out. Um, when we get to uh, our cross references here, Aaron, they even have uh, the new heavens and our new earth. Oh yeah, right after that, right? Yeah. So it says, "In the new, the heavens and the earth shall pass away, and, and that shall be belt up, melted up." And it says, um, "And here, here, this word seeing is not there, right?" It's just the word, therefore, all these things shall be dissolved. Um, what manner shall you be in holy 
behavior and godliness. Um, Verse 13. Look, looking for and speeding the, the coming day of the Lord in which the heaven and earth being a fire dissolved and the elements um, melted with fervent heat. Nevertheless, according to his promise, we look for a new heavens and a new earth in which dwells righteousness. And of course, right after that fire comes down in Revelation chapter 20, in Revelation 21, he sees a new heavens and new earth, right? right. So um, even though John wrote the longest book in the book of Revelations, we can see that Peter and James and Paul all had at least revelation about those days from the Holy Spirit, right? Right. And so when we get to now these things that he's referencing here, which is surprising, there's not more hints in the book of Revelation here. But if you go to Revelation 19, and this is when Jesus, I think it, I'm sorry, it might be Revelation 16, but bear with me here. When Jesus actually touches down to fight. It's got to be 19. Is it 19? It's not 16. That's uh, before. 17 is the uh, woman riding the beast. Okay. He says, maybe 18. 18? Yeah. I always forget this one. It is 16. It's Revelation 16, 15. So this is, this is when um, he's gathering them together at Armageddon. And he says... Verse 15, behold, I come as the thief, blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, unless he walk naked in the shame, and he gathered them unto a place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. So right before he comes to the battle of Armageddon, he comes as a thief for the battle of Armageddon, okay? The day of the Lord. Right, because the day of the Lord's been being poured out. He's pouring out the wrath, but when he finally shows up to fight them, that's when he's coming as a thief. And every time he references coming as a thief, he's talking about the unbelieving being unprepared to meet him. And then when you get into chapter 20, you have at the end of that, you have um, great white throne. I'm sorry. You have um, fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Okay. And they're all cast in the lake of fire. And we, the Bible doesn't get into all the metaphor of all this melting as a fervent heat, but that's the only place you can have it. You just see everything cast in the lake of fire. But like I said, that's where I interpret that's God's radiant glory dissolving the whole, the whole universe. And then immediately after that, you, you say, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more seed. So that's how you know it's dissolving the whole earth because it, immediately after that, he says, and I saw a first one and the, the last one was passed away. Okay. Chapter divisions are arbitrary. So we have all this. And this again, we haven't even gotten to the book of Revelation yet. But if we just go by what we have, we have 2,000 years. We have a latter rain, so we, we're going to have something like the outpouring at Pentecost, but bigger, right? Right. We have um, all these signs, the sun turned to darkness, moon turned to blood, blood, fires, and pillars of smoke, and all this stuff before the great day of the Lord, right? Right. Now, in the first coming, a repentant Jew is looking for the bride and the groom coming together, right? Mm -hmm. That's spiritually fulfilled. In the second coming, a repentant Jew is going to be looking for the bride and groom to come together physically, right? Right. And that is the rapture that is not yet fulfilled, okay? So what we're looking for then is all those signs that we mentioned, the blood, fire, pillars, smoke, sun turned darkness, moon turned blood, and all that leading up to a latter rain, leading up to the rapture. Does that make sense? So oh, yeah. we, we haven't even gotten into Revelation yet, and we have all this stuff laid out. And you can sit there and just try to reason out how could this work, and it only can work one way. Now the Revelation is going to come along as a second witness and lay all that out for you in order, okay? So um, let's, just, let's just do Revelation chapter 1, and we'll call that a wrap for today, and that's our intro. And then next week, we'll start in the seven churches, okay? <clears throat> so who wants to read Revelation chapter 1, starting with 1 through 8?
I'll go. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and all of the things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Verse eight, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Okay. So if that's all you have of the book of Revelation, are you going to be prepared to not be taken by the Antichrist? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because it says, every eye shall see him. Mm -hmm. That's that's mm -hmm. why that's that's why that's my book title right there. Everything you need to know to not be deceived by the Antichrist is right there. Every eye will see him. When he comes, there will no be, be nobody telling you that he's here. There will be no news report. There will be no whispers or rumors. There will be no secret enlightenment. Every eye will see him. So that's all you need to know to not be deceived by the Antichrist. Now you should be watching for him, right? Right. Um, right. And then he says, they also which pierced him. Who, who pierced him? The Jews. Romans. Jews and the Romans, right? But, but essentially, I, I mean, it's the Jews who put him to death, right? Mm -hmm. And all the kindreds of the earth shall will because of him. So we know God's an equal opportunity Jew and Gentile judgment here, right? Mm -hmm. um and and so then the other thing is this is the mysterious passage that most people get confused <laughs> on, but uh the seven spirits which are before his throne do you guys understand what that means bless yeah, you spirit. when you go back to isaiah it talks about the the, dip, the spirit of counsel the spirit of yeah i think it's isaiah yeah you're oh. right does isaiah. somebody have that off the top it's probably isaiah nine Okay. Uh, just a guess. That, that sounds about right, but we'll we'll read it just for good measure. So we remember that Jesus Christ was given the Spirit without measure, and we're all given a measure of the Holy Spirit, right? Right. So that's why we we share in the giftings. We all have little pieces of what Jesus had. Jesus had all the giftings, but I might have wisdom. Another person might have knowledge. Another person might have counsel. Another person might have might. Right. We. We're, we're intentionally weak in some areas and stronger in others. And God does that with us so that we rely on each other and depend on each other. And as a whole, that love it unites us all together in our need for one another and ultimately glorifies Christ because what we all have as an exception to the others is from Christ, right? right. So if I have all this Bible knowledge, I might have other things I'm totally weak in. Like I don't have a lot of patience. I need to rely on other people who are more patient than me or, or learn humility from somebody who's more humble than me and all these other things. Um, but what I have comes from God and their humility in the same way that comes from God and their patience that comes from God and their liberality of giving that comes from God and their prophesying in tongues or whatever, whatever their gifting is that they're contributing to the body. It comes from God. And when we see our own weaknesses, Next to our strengths, we realize, wow, man, like you're way more patient than I am, <laughs> you know, and it can be really easy for someone to be like, I have all this Bible knowledge, but you have no patience, right? And the other people, it's just as easy for somebody to be like, I have all this patience and, you know, you just have Bible knowledge, right? I mean, we'll do that. 
because fruits of the spirit and then you know knowledge and gifts of the spirit and other things can conflict against each other but the the reason they're all there is to for us to recognize that what we do have we have from god it's all grace and we all need each other for the body to function the way it should and be be fruitful the way it should um but jesus had it all and so when he died that seed goes into all of us and now we all have little pieces of what he had uh just like when if you well you guys have three kids right michael yeah are you already starting to see like a part of your personality and a part of Lakia's personality and, and bits and pieces of them in, in the individual kids but yep. some more of this and less of that right mm -hmm. that's our that's our new birth we have pieces of the personality of jesus a little more a little less here and there right and so jesus didn't have no bad size <laughs> so we're still part of adam <laughs> but um but anyways, yeah, he says, uh, for unto us, a child is born. Let's see. It's Isaiah 11. 11. Okay. It's Isaiah 11. Yeah, that would have been a long read. Verse <laughs> 1, 2. All right. So, okay. And there shall come out of a rod out of a stem of Jesse, and a branch will grow from his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. So the spirit of the Lord is one of them. These aren't subsets of that. The spirit of the Lord is actually his authoritativeness. The spirit of wisdom is him always knowing the right thing to do and say of understanding that's more about his empathy towards other people um the spirit of counsel um that's knowing what to say to other people um spirit of might that's his actual pow power and ability to do things the spirit of knowledge that's the all the stuff that he knows including men's hearts and things that supernaturally he shouldn't be able to know and then the fear of the lord see how those things are bookends of each other the spirit of the lord is all of his authority but his the fear of the lord is all his humility he has all that. And so that's, you know, we, we might have in the church people who have that spirit of the Lord because they're meant to be a leader, right? Like in pastoral authority or a prophet or an evangelist, they have to go out there with, with a sense of authority. And Paul would have that a lot in his letters, right? Like he's saying, I, I mean, he's just laying it down for him. He's like, we'll see what happens when I show up or let's see what kind of authority that you have. Or if I'm not a father to them, I'm a father to you because I've got you and the Lord. And he's not saying that because he's not a humble person. He's saying because there's a that calling and that office has an authority that comes with it. Um, but then there's also humility that goes with it. So um, even us, like, for instance, being subservient to a pastor or a teacher and things like that, it's not because we're better or worse or they're better or they're worse. That's that spirit of humility because that's the gifting we're given in the body, um, more so or less so than they are, right? But all these things make up to, you know, when you deal with might, that's power, counsel, understanding, all your words of knowledge, your words of wis wisdom, your miracles, your giftings are all laced up in these seven things. And obviously seven's a metaphor for the whole. And then the whole is in Jesus. And so that's why you have the seven spirits that are before the Lord. And again, the revelation, you never have the Holy Spirit referred to like that, except in this prophecy and in revelation, which goes to show the revelation expects you to read the old testament prophets so you know what you're talking about and we tend not to do that we tend to come up with you know reptile people theories dollar sign theories <laughs> instead of bible theories um so anyways um you have the father him who sits on the throne you have the seven spirits before his throne and you have Jesus Christ. So you have the Trinity and then you have us being made kings and priests being, being um, washed in his blood. And he is coming in the clouds. That's where we stand right now when John gives us, and this is the last book of the new Testament. And so, um, yeah, when I, when I do get my new Testament thing done, it's going to be a treat. I'd recommend you guys take some time because there's stuff that God's showing me about the new Testament and how it's patterned like the old Testament. Cause I don't know if I told you when I was translating Matthew, like literally the first two words in the book of Matthew translate to the book of Genesis. And Matthew was the first book written in the, in the new Testament. And then you have this pattern where you have um, all this stuff written. And then at the end you have Jerusalem destroyed and you have James and Jude who James dies and Jude goes into exile into, he actually goes to Libya. And then you have Jesus who dies before that. Well, before the temple was destroyed the first time, you have King Josiah, and he has three sons. One, um, one goes into Egypt and dies there. That's like Jesus going down to the grave and dying. One goes to uh, 
Babylon, Babylon and dies there. And then one, um, I'm trying to think, then one uh, gets taken in captivity to Babylon. So he's got three sons doing that around the first destruction and around the second destruction. And then you have a gap for a while while they're in, you know, the, the Gentile captivity. And then they come back. And then Ezra, who's the priest, he comes back with these extra prophecies and all the chronicles. And he puts the Bible together at the end. And you literally have all the stuff about the rebuilding of the temple. You have all the stuff from Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, um, Haggai, and then Esther and all that stuff now under Ezra. So it's like when you see the typology of that, John is actually, I believe John is related to the priesthood. And so he's kind of like the new Ezra coming back with that extra set of things after the temple is destroyed. And so it's like 40 years later when he starts writing this. So I'm going to, I'm going to start writing all that and coordinating that all in. So when you're reading this summary, it's basically like you're starting chronologically with what they had. And then you're, you're getting the pattern of from the new Testament to the old, because it's almost like it's almost like the New Testament is the commentary and summary of the Old Testament really clearly. And so now we're in verse 9. Someone want to read 9 till 20? Yeah, I'll read it. It says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of, the, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou have seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So he's telling you to write all these things that he's seeing. And notice he breaks it down to things which are already and things hereafter, not yet, right? So there are people who think like already not yet is like a theory, right? Like this just came about. But he just says things that are, things shall be hereafter. So that's already and not yet, right? And when we get into the, the seven letters to the churches, also, if you guys can read Matthew 13, because they're gonna, we're going to show how those things correspond. Because remember, he just says the things that are the things that are hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw on the seven candles, which is the seven churches, right? Mm -hmm. So that he's referring to what's going to go on with the church now, in other words, in this present age, and then the hereafter, the not yet, okay? Right. Um. So in Matthew 13, he says, um, he's given the parable, it starts with the seed and the sower. And at the end of that, he says, then he said to them, therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like a man who is the householder, who brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. So not 
already, not yet. See that? Mm -hmm. So you want to read those because that's going to be a second witness to the seven churches there. And I'm going to show you how those things all link together. So it will probably take us at least two sessions to go through this. Um, but we'll, we will, it depends on how heavy we get into the church history because everybody's got kind of di different things probably to think about in terms of church history. Um, but I'll give you like the overview. Chuck, Chuck Missler does this pretty well too. He doesn't match up. I think actually he might actually match up Matthew 13, but I don't think he gets into the same level of detail that I did. Um, but he, he does say, you know, where he says um, to him who has ears, let him, let him hear. That's another way they're connected because he says that after every one of these sayings, just like he does in the seven letters. So that's kind of your hint that these things are supposed to attach together. He, he, he gives an already not yet statement on both of them. He says, let him do as ears to hear, you know, match up to both of them. And then he has the seven letters and the seven, seven kingdom parables. So um, we'll get into that. I, that's the first, I think, what is it? Chapter two and three in my book that I cover most of that. Have all you guys read my book by chance? I haven't finished it. Okay. Not yet. Have you guys read that part? I'm in that chapter. Okay. So, so I think that's a, that's a pretty long part of my book because it covers all of church history. I think it's like 50 pages. Um, but we've got two weeks if you guys want to start poking through that. Um, that will just kind of make us breeze through a little faster because when, when I'm doing it here, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to give as many details as I can for people who might be watching and listening in the future, not just for us. Um, but definitely, you know, read these two things. And then if you have time, you know, prioritize this. But if you have time, read that in the book as well. Um, and we'll, and then once we're done with that, we're going to get into the things not yet, which is going to start in chapter four of the revelation. And that's when we get into the seven seals. So, um, that's the church age. That's going to be this next slide. And we're going to, you know, fill this in a little bit with some details, probably about each one, um, probably some main things to remember about each segment of the church history. And then, uh, we just know Philadelphia receives a promise to be taken out of that, the trial that's going to come on the whole earth. And some of these churches receive a promise to get left behind. So they're not just church eras. They're going to be churches that existed in history. They're going to be seven eras. And then they're going to be kinds of churches that are all going to exist in the last day. Okay. So that's it. We're, we are, we're going to bridge the gap now in these next couple of sessions between the former reign and the latter reign. And then, then by the end of the six seals, we'll get to the latter reign. Okay. Nice. All right. Um, someone want to wrap us up in prayer? I'll do it. All right. Father, we come before you. Thank you for another time of fellowship and increasing knowledge and learning your ways and understanding your mysteries you left for us to understand and help us gird ourselves in your word and just stay focused and we thank you for another opportunity to serve and we thank you for working on our spirits to just be better servants to you and your kingdom father and we thank you for forgiving us of our sins and we we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins and be raised on the third day for our justification father and we just ask that you continue to work in our lives keep us in good health keep our families protected um, and just help us prosper day to day and also to just reveal to new people on our day to day about your son and his sacrifice for our souls and we just thank you for that and we ask for a productive week and we love you we glorify your name thank you for sending your son in the name of Jesus Christ we pray amen amen all right everybody you be blessed and have a good week uh, anyone need any anything kept in prayer before we go Always pray for me. I ain't going to take it. <laughs>